I rise to move the motion in my name that this House notes the tabling in the Victorian Parliament of its Legal and Social Issues Committee report into the use of cannabis in Victoria and urges the McGowan Government to consider undertaking similar research here in Western Australia. The Victorian report is built on the back of two simple but far-reaching questions. How do we keep cannabis out of the hands of young people and how do we keep cannabis out of the hands of criminals? In the mental health space, the following findings were made. The causal link between cannabis use and some mental illnesses is unclear. Some people with existing mental health issues may be drawn to cannabis use to read their symptoms uh, and in doing so, exacerbate their mental, health, uh, their mental illness further. For this group, cannabis is a compounding factor rather than a cause. And the population level risk for the development of psychosis and psychotic disorders as a result of cannabis use is very low. The risk of neurological damage caused by early onset cannabis use can be mitigated by measures such as education campaigns about the danger of cannabis use for young people and legalising cannabis and prohibiting its sale to young people. We are currently a part of the problem rather than a part of the solution. Our inactivity in some cases and our active mistrust of the research in others is hurting ordinary women and men, certainly in Victoria, and I have no doubt here in Western Australia as well. If there is one thing that has struck me over the past few months, and it may have struck other members as well as they have listened to ask us to us ask question after question of our police and justice ministers, it is the fact that we simply do not keep, we, do, we cannot or will, will not share numbers around these issues here in WA. If it takes an in inquiry such as this to reveal those numbers, then for that reason alone, I would be inclined to support one. A criminal record for a minor cannabis use or possession offence creates barriers to housing education and employment for individuals. These barriers are counterproductive to rehabilitation and reintegration, possibly increasing the likelihood of reoffending. There are su substantial costs involved in policing cannabis use through the criminal justice system, including in police resources, court expenses, cost of imprisonment, community corrections and legal aid and prosecution, and the effectiveness of this massive investment in criminalisation. The report finds that Victoria spends millions of dollars annually criminalising cannabis, but criminal organisations are still making millions of dollars cultivating and selling cannabis in Victoria. These funds are being funneled into other criminal activity, including the manufacture of far more dangerous substances. I have absolutely no doubt we, that we are inflicting the same costs, if not higher costs, on the taxpayers of WA. But we are to prove that we need to be willing to investigate and report back here in our own state with our own data. How much might we save here in WA, or how much money might we be able to re reallocate from criminal justice budget across into health and housing possibly if we simply acknowledge that the war on drugs has failed. Imagine if we had a war on drug harm instead. School-based drug education is more effective when it is based on harm minimization approach and not abstinence-based messaging. I commend the foresight of the Victorian Parliament in commissioning this report and I urge the House to acknowledge it and to consider if we might not usefully do something similar here in Western Australia during the lifetime of this Parliament. The Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, uh, President. I stand to make some comments with regard to this motion. I've got to say, I've never had an illicit drug in my life and that includes cannabis. So I'd be one of the few, I'm sure. 2021. Smoking is almost a hanging offence, and it will be apparently in about 10 years' time, and cannabis is, is, um, is an accepted norm. My concern with um, cannabis is that it not be deemed as an entrance drug, and that is that it not be deemed as a, a soft option, particularly for young people, and then to move on to higher-order drugs, illicit drugs. My aim, as I said, is 
not to pass judgment on cannabis, and I'm, I've definitely softened in that respect, and particularly with regard to, um, to the criminalisation of cannabis. Right? But I have not softened in terms of my attitude towards the imperative component of school drug education and the implications of cannabis use with um, students. The Honourable Brian Walker. We as a party were actually much more interested in cannabis as a plant, a whole plant, of which personal use is but one. Uh, but as a medical practitioner, my first uh, concern is to ensure wellness, and that also in involves the issue of minimising damage, minimising the harm because there's no one who will be uh, uh, maintaining the point of view that cannabis is benign. It's a, it's a safe drug as far as drugs go. It's far safer than alcohol, certainly safer than tobacco, but it is not a benign drug, and it's certainly there are concerns which can be raised. The amount of harm we perceive can be caused is less than we fear. And the other aspect is that we minimise the extent of harm that can be caused by undertaking um, uh, 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 methods such as the, the uh, education within the schools to educate about drugs. Because one thing we absolutely know with certainty is that cannabis given into the hands of criminals is a great way of causing harm. Uh, but yes, the harm minimisation, but he cautioned. We need to take uh, cautious steps. We need to have informed steps forward. Because if we're not careful, we can go down the path of big uh, uh, tobacco and big alcohol, who, who's actually, they have the same intent as the criminal organisations. They want to increase their profits. What I really wanted to speak about here is the driving laws and cannabis, because that is something which I think has a lot of, uh, of concern in the cannabis-using population. And by cannabis-using population, I refer specifically to my patients who have been prescribed cannabis and have been told by the police officers that they are now criminals. Example, I mean, it's not illegal to drink alcohol, but it is illegal to drive with alcohol. So why, why is that inconsistent? Uh, it's an excellent question, and thank you for asking that. And the answer is because we haven't actually quantified how much is safe. At the moment, we have a 0 0.05 limit for alcohol. Agreed. Now, I know people who on 0 0.02 ought not to be driving, but more particularly, if you have 0 0.02 and you're, you're, the, the police find that, they don't ask if you're taking an antihistamine together with alcohol, which absolutely makes you incapable of driving, because uh, is safely driving, because you would be clinically impaired. But the police are not actually testing for impairment, they're testing for the presence of 0 0.05 of alcohol and beyond. When it comes to THC, what they are testing for is the presence of THC full stop. And by doing so, they are then comparing that and saying this is uh, equivalent to being impaired. The presence of THC alone in your system is now defined to be a measure of impairment. And therefore, your licence is taken off you. Therefore, you appear in front of the magistrate. Therefore, you are possibly given a criminal conviction. And therefore, you carry that for the rest of your life. Norway has an approach there which allows us to, to measure the impairment. And there's a level that you can check. We could discuss the levels, but that, of course, is something entirely different. That's a, for another discussion down the road, perhaps after our own committee, if we are granted one, is given permission to report. People that have been prescribed it, they can't use that as a defence, that in the courts it's not. Can they raise the fact that they have had a prescription uh, to constitute a defence? Indeed, that is so. There's a quote here, um, it, there's a list of comparable jurisdictions in that regard, and um, this is table 4.8 on page 176. The United Kingdom, medical defence. Norway, there's a medical defence. Germany, there's a medical defence. Ireland, there's a medical defence. New Zealand, there's a medical defence. But in, in Australia, and in, in Western Australia in particular, I'm concerned about WA, there is no defence. Our police force is now required by our laws to declare a person with the presence of THC, whatever the level, whatever the time, to be impaired. So actually what we're saying to our police force is we are empowering you to become professional liars. And, uh, I'm sure all of us um, on this side of the House, because certainly our government's policy is one of harm minimisation, uh, that we will be um, extremely interested, I think, in, um, in, reading, uh, in reading that report. And we um, uh, clearly understand uh, that our 
our friends from uh, the Legalised Cannabis Party um, clearly have a, have a, a mandate to, uh, to be pressing for these issues. Uh, and uh, I think it's an important part of, uh, of an ongoing debate um, within, our, uh, within our community. Uh, we do absolutely support uh, the notion of, uh, of harm minimisation. Um, and uh, I think, uh, but we certainly uh, have no plans. We did not go to the election with uh, a program uh, around this, and at this particular point in time, uh, we have uh, no plans to uh, take um, uh, the steps forward that I know our friends who've moved the motion and spoken to the motion would like. Um, but I think we're always interested in having a look at the evidence uh, that has, um, has emerged. The Honourable Brian Walker has, has raised an issue which I'm certainly uh, happy to uh, take uh, back to the attorney uh, and, uh, and for comment uh, that, um, that we may have people that have uh, quantities of THC as a result of uh, their perfectly legal uh, activity uh, and that there needs to be some assessment of uh, whether or not that level of THC actually uh, does constitute uh, an impairment. And I think the, uh, the propositions that you have put forward here is um, to allow a, a medical defence. Now, I'll, I'll certainly be uh, seeking um, uh, some comment um, on that point. Uh, Peter Collier assures us that he is a man of, uh, of uh, very few vices, or, or certainly not of the, um, uh, of the type that the majority of the population has engaged in. He keeps his vices within the clan. Um, I certainly can't um, make the same claims that he has made, uh, but I... And with that, I would be more typical of the population, I'd have to say. Uh, and uh, I think that's a useful thing to be in, uh, in Parliament. I think it is, uh, it's a good motion. These are good debates uh, to, to have here. The debate we have around, um, around illicit drug use uh, and mechanisms to reduce the harm caused by the use of illicit drugs is important and looking at how other nations, other jurisdictions deal with um, not just cannabis but other, other drugs as well uh, and what they've, what they've found in terms of uh, you know, whether you should treat um, uh, the use of a, an amount of, whatever that happens to be, of, of, of drugs as a health issue rather than a criminal issue and, and what the outcome is for community in that in that respect is quite interesting. And obviously a part of that, uh, as the Honourable Peter Collier talked about, is, is absolutely about education. Uh, of course, alcohol um, is one of those very difficult drugs to get off. Um, something else that the committee did, did find, and I, and I have to admit I found it very surprising, was that alcohol is actually one of the hardest um, drugs to come off and actually very, very dangerous for the patient. And I found that absolutely uh, fascinating, and yet that's obviously legal. So. <laughs> I rise today to support this sensible motion and offer a few brief remarks on the topic of cannabis reform. I believe this motion represents an opportunity for the McGowan government to take a more progressive stance on the issue of recreational use of cannabis in Western Australia. I'm typically a data-driven person. I like to see the evidence. And I would normally take this opportunity to talk about the health benefits and some of the studies done in other jurisdictions and countries around the world where recreational cannabis is legalised. As support for this motion, however, I think this argument is best left to my honourable cannabis colleagues. However, I will quickly touch on my personal experience of having lived in Washington State where recreational use of cannabis was legalised. Now, I certainly won't admit to cannabis use in Western Australia and test the limits of parliamentary privilege, but I can go one step further than the Honourable Peter Collier and admit to recreational use personally of cannabis in Washington. 
Yes, correct. <laughs> correct, Minister. Yes. Absolutely. But is I just there, want to emphasize are, is that Is there point. other part, places perhaps where you might have also? I, I'm not here to speculate. I, I wouldn't classify my use in, in Washington as antisocial or debilitating in any way. In Washington, it is considered socially acceptable and has been pointed out previously, and I'm sure there's a body of work to support this, is less addictive and damaging than, than alcohol, which is legal. I also rise to speak in support of the motion that the Honourable Safia Momon has, has moved. Much of what this report, in fact, the overwhelming majority of what this report is consistent with, I think, what the Greens policy has been in this space for a long time, um, which, of course, is good, And because I, I often do make the point that, the, that our policies are based around, actually making sure it's based around the best evidence. But I do want to um, thank the, the Honourable Safia Momon for, for bringing this report bring this report um, and bringing it with the evidence into this parliament. And I do hope on the back of that that we can see changes in this state that actually, uh, as the Honourable uh, uh, Wilson Tucker said, I mean that we don't wait a while on this, we actually get in front of it because I think there are real benefits around reducing harm and improving quality of life in our community. The Honourable Sophia Mormont uh, in reply. Thank you, President. So I'd like to thank all the honourable members here for their contributions to this debate. Um, in particular, the acknowledgement by the honourable Elena McTiernan for recognising the unfairness of THC presence versus impairment in medical use. Uh, I've received quite a few emails of people not being able to continue with their FIFO work because they are using medicinal cannabis and therefore would fail any drug testing on site. Another aspect of that is that those people who used to use cannabis recreationally and then uh, because it takes such a long time for it to come out of their system have gone to harder drugs like methamphetamine to be able to maintain their FIFO work. So, uh, methamphetamine takes about 48 hours to clear, where it is, uh, with cannabis THC, it can take four to six weeks and sometimes longer, depending on the person. So by regulating the growing and the selling, you are reducing the uh, criminal activity that's associated with cannabis use. One of the things that you see in younger people who are experimenting with cannabis is a lack of understanding of uh, dose, but also combi combining it with alcohol. They don't know their own bodies, they don't know their own limits either, and it is when they combine it with alcohol that they end up being very sick and uh, presenting to uh, emergency departments. People with a higher IQ are much more likely to explore their consciousness uh, than those who don't. 